Thank you for inviting us to come here to talk about our experiences in Paris. And I'm going to sort of set the stage uh, as to at least what I experienced. As Jim said, I'm a graduate student in human rights education. So my going to Paris was very much focused on, is there anything I can do in terms of human rights education that would that climate change would benefit from and that would benefit from being a human rights educator. And I've come back actually with a bit of a mixed message. But that doesn't mean that we should give up any hope, because uh, there is, as Sir John Gilgood said, hope springs eternal. So I'm starting with uh, the end of the Paris um, talks. COP21, I don't know if everybody knows what COP stands for, but it's Conference of Parties, which is part of the UNFCCC. Yeah, you've got to learn a lot of uh, lingo if you're going to go to something like this. And that's the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, so you know, at the end of my presentation, I'll give you a little quiz and see if you've remembered that. <laughs> um, and if you haven't, you know, that means several demerits. Um, but um, it was. I have to set the stage for you. There were two zones in Paris. Um, first of all, it was held just outside of Paris, about a half hour by train, in the old airport. If you are over the age of um, uh, 40, you may know Le Bourget as the area that was the airport um, before Charles de Gaulle became the airport. Um, it was also chosen because a lot of the um, Big wigs could land their little planes there and their big planes there. So, you know, there's, there's that. And it was just after the bombings, about not even a month. So it was, it was a good idea that it was there. And security was really high. But there were two zones there. And you'll see a picture of one of them. The blue zone was for the important people, which unfortunately, if you weren't credentialed, you couldn't get in. That's where the um, actual negotiations took place. Um, the sponsoring organization that sent uh, all of us there, CGRER, which I never know what it stands for, the Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research. I got it. Um, Jerry Schnorr, who is a co-director there, he did have his credentials and was in the Blue Zone, although even within the Blue Zone, there was areas where everybody could be, and there was areas where you just couldn't be because you weren't important enough. OK. Um, then there was the green zone. And that's where we were. We ended up in the area that uh, where a lot of NGOs were, where the public could go. Um, and that was fascinating in and of itself. But I'll get to that in, the, in a minute. It turns out um, the woman on the left, Christine, and I never remember her, uh, her last name, she was the secretary um, from the UN for climate change, so very important. Um, the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, the president of the conference, COP21, Laurent Fabius, and the president of France, Hollande. Um, it turns out that Fabius, Fabius spent an awful lot of time talking with every single delegation to try and get this agreement, which finally did pass, passed. He spent many sleepless nights, as many other people did too. But he paid, played a key role. And I heard this from Jerry Schnorr, because he was obviously in a position to hear all of this. But he said that Fabius was all over the place, talking with everybody, trying to get this through, because this really was an agreement that needed to pass, which fortunately it did. So yes, it was deservedly a moment of great uh, pride for everybody. And I don't know if anybody saw the footage of it, but there were people crying in the audience, um, probably from lack of sleep, but also because it really was quite an achievement that all 195 countries that participated unanimously agreed to this, including the United States, who has a love-hate relationship with the UN. So it's something to be pretty um, happy about. 
So of course you have to know what we did um, other than be wonderful representatives. Um, but we ate French food. Um, and that's a picture of Nick in front of the Notre Dame because we did take time off from our busy schedules. Um, so, you know, we're well rounded as far as that is concerned. This was the entrance to the Blue Zone. And when you get off the bus, there's, you, you arrive at the train station, and then there are buses that take you to the venue. You are not allowed inside the venue or the area around the venue on your own. You have to go through a bus. Um, and it stops right in front of this. So everybody gets out and goes in there, but you're not allowed in there because it's the blue zone. So we all have to go back and then walk about 40 miles, it felt like, the first day because we arrived and from an overnight flight and immediately went to the venue. And so it's like, OK, this feels like forever walking. But it looks pretty cool, doesn't it? It's, um, it and we had good weather. We, that was another good thing in December. What you see there on the bottom left is a tree with leaves that rotate. And it's called the wind tree. So instead of a big windmill that goes around and around, these are leaves that rotate and um, generate energy, which is really pretty cool. Um, that's something that you, know, you could put in your backyard if you wanted to. Um, I don't know exactly how it works. I'm not that scientifically inclined. But nonetheless, it was right out there and sets the tone right away for what this climate conference is all about. And I put that picture up there because there were, I don't know how many different presentations that we could participate in during the day. Um, and that's what one of the rooms looked like. Now, you can't see this, but it was a human rights education um, presentation that I took that picture of. And um, it's a bittersweet situation with that, which I'll get to later. So there's hope. But I didn't think anybody in here would think that there wasn't hope. Is there? No. OK. Whew. So the fact that 195 countries plus the EU signed this gives a lot of hope globally. Um, is anybody here familiar with how this whole COP thing works, how this climate change conference idea works? Every country sends in what's called an INDC. Um, and it's a declaration of intentions of how your country is going to combat climate change. Um, and given all of that, then there's a, and I'm, my, I'm really proud of how the UN does this. I mean, imagine having to take 195 of these. Some of them are only like three pages, and some of them are 30 pages. And getting it down to, well, what do we all agree on based on these documents from around the world as to what needs to happen around the world? The sum total of that was that the temperature of the world or the globe was going to increase by 4 degrees Celsius. Now, if I'm talking tech speak here, um, bear with me for a moment, because I had to learn a lot of this, and I'm still absolutely no expert on this. But four degrees is too high. You have to imagine the globe either as a car with its uh, the windows rolled up in the summer, and you don't have air conditioning. So what happens? It heats up. What do you do? You open the windows, and you let some of the heat out. Well, apparently, we can't do that because we produce more heat than we can release either through the ocean or that's absorbed by the ocean or that is sent out into the atmosphere and back out into space. That means that the, the world is heating up. That's what this is all about. And the more it heats up, the more it has effect on every ecosystem on the globe and our, us and our health. Um, so. I have no doomsday stories here. I leave that to the scientists. But it's important that we not go that high. Um, the big thing about COP21 was that everybody agreed in the agreement that it was going to be 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that's big. How big? I don't know. I'm, again, not the expert on this. But it's a good sign. It means that people are 
conscious of the fact that we really need to do a lot of hard work in order to keep us within this one and a half degree in, uh, increase in temperature. Um, the other important issue that came out of the agreement was there's a lot of places out there that are suffering the consequences of climate change but haven't been really the producers of the pollutants and whatever else you want to call um, that has um, contributed to climate change and, cl and global warming. And those are countries like the Maldive Islands, which are disappearing. Um, in fact, they have inst their president has instituted a program to evacuate the island if this continues, because it's just going to disappear. So there is a responsibility of countries like the United States, European countries, certainly China, um, and I think Brazil is up there, to do something about their polluting activities, if you will, or their global warming activities. And there's a fund that has been set up. Um, and I'm sure at some point in the future, there's going to be a lot of discussion about who's responsible for putting money into that fund. And that could be an issue that's, that's not everybody is going to be happy with. The countries that are suffering the most are very happy because it is part of the agreement. Let me just say that this is not a treaty but it is a binding agreement. That means that if they signed it, every country has to do what they said they were going to do. So it behooves us to become familiar with it to whatever degree that you can or that you want and to keep putting pressure on government, Congress, senators, the president, your local people um, to do what we can in order to help make this a reality. One of the things is called the agenda of solutions. That's point number four. And that's the contribution of cities, businesses, NGOs, and people like you and me, just individuals. And the interesting thing about that is there's a whole consortium of mayors around the United States and around the world that lobbied very uh, um, hard for solutions. Um, Nick spoke to Mayor County and Mayor Buell about that. Um, when we were in Paris. Okay, but there are still people out there who say, I'm not really sure. And I had a question um, in uh, Iowa City last. Well, what do we do with people who deny climate change? And I suggested instead of trying to come up with reasons why you should convince the other why it's important about a hot climate change. Ask them to tell you why they don't think there's a man-made reason for climate change. And then take the discussion more, uh, further. Because I don't think that you can convince them with the science. Um, you can only convince them with their own arguments and turning them back on themselves. But this might help. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> anyway, so just a, a bit um, how global warming works. Again, it's greenhouse gases. And the major component of greenhouse gases um, is carbon. And I'm mentioning that because that's going to become important in a minute. And the major produ producers of greenhouse gases are what we are fossil fuels. Now, one of my pet peeves in Iowa City is the public transportation is really lousy. Um, so that means I have to use my car to get from point A to point B, and then to point C, and then back home. I would be very happy to one bicycle, but it's a little too hilly for my old legs, um, or take a bus. Then I would leave my car at home. Would I then be contributing less? Oh, yeah, because you could get electric buses. There was even a stand at. Um, well, there were several stands at COP21 of electric bus manufacturers. So it's an idea, and I think it would be a great idea. And I think if you here in Cedar Falls do have a great bus system, then maybe I should consider moving here. But if not, think about lobbying for public transportation that is also environmentally friendly. My son and my husband think that the Prius is the ugliest car that was ever made. <laughs> Um, but I think there's that other aspect of it is it is more environmentally friendly and electric cars. I know in Holland, where I'm originally from, 
are much more of, well, I wouldn't say they're the norm, but you see them a lot more. That's another way to go. So what can the Iowa UNA do? Now, this whole carbon literate thing is because of two, re uh, well, one main reason. One of the presentations I attended, one of the speakers was a man, Dave Colvin, from Manchester, UK. And he started a project called the Carbon Literacy Project. And what it does is it makes people carbon literate. Well, what does that mean? That means that you know how much, you, well, you know what carbon is, which I think is a good starting point. You know what you do that contributes to too much carbon going into the air, such as a car with all the emissions, or um, your heating at home. I don't know, natural gas isn't here, but we have oil a lot of places, or if there are still people that use coal, which is possible, that's a contributor. Well, understanding that, that knowledge, means that you can also change your behavior if you so choose, and I, and I would vote that you do, um, to reduce it. And the Carbon Literacy Project is jointly with civil society, um, faith communities, the University of Manchester, um, and employers. It is a citywide project where everybody who wants to can become carbon literate. It is even so that the University of Manchester has instituted carbon literacy courses at the university and requires them, and that some employers are even asking potential employees, are you carbon literate? Which looks good on your resume and is good for the employer. So we'll get into that in a little more in a minute. Um, the sad thing about that same presentation was there was a woman there from Australia who was absolutely brilliant and who did have credentials in the blue zone. And she said that human rights, that climate change violates human rights, was part of the agreement as an article, which meant that if it was remained there and was signed, it would have been legally binding that every government does everything in its power to make sure that our hum or that human rights are not violated and that you as an individual could say my human rights are being violated by whatever climate change thing that was interest of interest to you unfortunately because of deal making which happens everywhere and there's compromise and i understand that it ended up in the preamble which means that it's a great statement of intent but it is not legally binding so that was one of the more depressing moments of uh, the, um, the conference. That picture I showed you of the um, workshop that I attended where the human rights education was, well, the reason why I didn't do anything with that was because Paris, well, France, you know, you got to speak French in France because they prefer that you do, although I was amazed at how English literate everybody was. But not everybody can speak two languages. So there had to be translators, either from French to English or English to French. And at this particular presentation, while I understand French, this guy had this insane idea that everybody understands French at warp speed. It was like, no. Um, so I'm like, yeah, no, this isn't going to work. So then he, present, he uh, indicated the first woman who spoke. And she decided, since he's at warp speed, I'm going to go at warp speed. And there was no translator. Well, that made it a little difficult, um, certainly for uh, my colleague who was with me, whose French is not as, not as good as mine. We said, you know, bag this, which was uh, unfortunate. We can do it. I know we can. So the Carbon Literacy Project is about understanding what I actually need to do, where I can get help to do it, and actually doing it and seeing that I've done it. Wow, that's great. So if you'll just take a moment to read this, these are the learning methods. So it's, to some degree, peer-to-peer -peer learning. So anybody from any organization could become carbon, a carbon literacy trainer and then 
train the rest of their organization. There have been schools that have done it where the kids are actually training their parents. The parents think that's cool. At a local mall in Manchester, there were kids who were explaining to visitors to the mall, shoppers, what this project is. And kids are really great at sort of, you know, they have, they just come right in and say, you know, you're doing it wrong. And that sometimes is the way to do it. It's knowledge for the most part. And I think, I know for me, there's a lot I don't know about carbon. There's a lot I do that probably is not good. There are probably things that I do that are good. Um, but before you can change anything, you have to change your thinking. And in order to change your thinking, you have to know what, what it's all about. And that's where the knowledge portion of carbon literacy comes in. Um, it also means that you can look at it not only from the point of view of yourself, but from the point of view of your community, the state, nationally, and if you want, you can look at it internationally. Um, you know, you could set up a whole project with people in Manchester, UK. Who knows? You might get to go there and visit, which is something that I keep hoping for. Um, but they haven't invited me yet. Um, there's also the other part of it is once you know, you can also identify things you are already doing. And that's something really great when you say, oh, God, we're really doing this. So you know, that's one thing we can check off the list and something to be proud of and say, hey, you know, this is really great because our organization, our community is already doing this. I'm a firm believer that knowledge leads to attitude and behavior differences. And I am also a f firm believer that this can actually make a difference. Um, so that's where the values come in. And it does require some changes. And I think that I would not be off the mark that some people here or in the community, certainly in the state, and very most certainly in the country, um, would say, you know, I'm pretty happy with the way things are going. And other people can take the responsibility of making changes. and. OK, um, that's fine. I mean, you, you're not here, or, and I'm certainly not here to make everybody in this room change or be different. Um, but if it's something that resonates with you, this is a way, perhaps, to do it. Um, there may be other ways, but I like this one. Um, and then there's action. And I like the fact that it asks you to do just one thing. Perhaps it's, I'm not going to take the car. I don't know. I could walk to the, uh, there's a mall, a small mall near me. I could walk there and do my shopping. I'd have to carry it back, but you know, sometimes you got to do that. Maybe I should do that instead of taking the car one day. I do try and do things every time that my son or my husband can drive me to the university and pick me up. That saves my car driving and it <laughs> saves me parking too, but you know, that's okay. Um, but I also think that this is an opportunity to bring a community together in order because there's a goal that you want to create. It's a simple one. What does it mean to be carbon literate? What does it mean to make a change in my life and in the lives of other people along with me so that we can, uh, we can do that? Um, I don't know if you all know the 100 grannies. OK, so their big thing is, um, at least in Iowa City and how I know them, is plastic bags. Now, I, as I said before, I come from Holland. And in Holland, um, in fact, on January 1st, every store has been um, prohibited from putting articles, even clothing, in plastic bags. If you want a plastic bag for whatever outfit you've bought or groceries that you have, you have to pay for a plastic bag. Now, groceries were always, you always had to bring your own crate or your own bag. So that was pretty easy. But now that every store, music store, clothing store, you name it, you don't get a plastic bag anymore. Now, the Hy-V and the Walmart are, to me, the biggest polluters in, I mean, they have competitions on how well, at the Hy-V, how well you can bag groceries. Now, I think that's great, but it means using plastic bags. And what happens to plastic bags? they end up on landfill. Yeah. And when they end up on landfill, they create all <laughs> kinds of gases as they're decomposing, which takes forever. 
that's really not good. So that could be a community-wide activity. So in Iowa City, they don't use plastic bags? They do, unfortunately. I'm, it's something that we're still working on. But tell me about these 100 grand. I'm not all that I only know that they, one of their projects is to get rid of plastic bags at the Hy-Vee. That's, I'm afraid, all I can, I can tell you, but I can give you um, afterwards. Okay, well. They were also at the Bakken Pipeline um, hearing, as I was told before. You can find it if you Google. Yeah. So they do a lot. I just know them because I have this thing about plastic bags. I'll have to find out more That's about them. <laughs> so, you know, I'm the eternal optimist. There's the yellow brick road leading to the Emerald City, and we all know how well that turns out. Um, you know, everybody gets a heart, a brain, and, a, and courage. But I think that for me, COP21 was overwhelming. I mean, you can only be in one place at one time, and when there were protests going on outside, you'd be in a workshop, and if there were protests, you were missing a workshop that was really important. It's like, you know, you can only do so much. Um, so I'm hoping next time around, maybe we can go with a much bigger delegation than we were this time. Um, it was fascinating to see people. Uh, one thing that I felt was that the attacks in Paris did lower the number of stands that were there. Now, Jerry Schnorr did say that there were a lot more there than I had noticed, but when you go to a trade show, you know, you may know, it's always packed with people and there was just too much room to move um, with all the stands. Most of them were French stands, so that was fine, but it doesn't always translate into an Iowa situation and that's something Nick will go into much more than I have. Um, and there wasn't much when it came to human rights. It's sort of like you have to think of, okay, well, how can I do this? How can I translate it into a human rights um, situation? Um, but it's a UN thing. I think it was really successful if there was a unanimous agreement, which it was, something that we can be proud of. And, but the proof is now going to be in the pudding, as they say. Exactly. And I hope that, um, and I've noticed, I noticed when I was there that the amount of reporting on COP21 in American newspapers well, online, was pretty small. I know that the Press Citizen didn't cover it, um, and the Des Moines Register follows, or they follow each other. Uh, but even the big papers, um, unless John Kerry was doing something, it was like, you know, we're not interested in it. Well, there's got to be a concerted effort to do that, um, because this isn't going to go away. Even if you think that this isn't man-made, there's something happening. I mean, this is a really mild winter. These have been the, I think, the 10 warmest years generally since the beginning of measuring weather or climate. There's a difference. I learned that. Um, so, you know, there is something going on there. And yes, we are contributing to it. So let's find a way that as a UNA, we can certainly do something because you know, we are spreading, to some degree, the word of the UN, and this is a UN agreement. So I guess actually I might start off by addressing a few of the questions that um, I don't think Andrea felt quite as comfortable maybe addressing. Um, in regards to the, the students being an influence, I, you know, to be completely honest, I don't know how much of an influence the students are, but they have actually made some pretty significant efforts um, with a biomass, biomass fuel project, they're calling it. Um, they've tried various different uh, plants and whatnot and tried burning those in place of coal at the power plant. So they've actually had to retrofit the power plant to be able to burn this and uh, produce energy almost as efficiently. I don't think it is quite as efficient as coal yet, but they have made efforts to do that. Specifically, there's a plant called Miscanthus that they plant, I don't know if you and I, you and I may be doing something with that, but um, they plant fields of basically just this really tall grass that they're doing that with miscanthus as well. So the university has made efforts in that regards, but again, I don't know how much the students had much of a say in it. Um, and then regards to the um, kind of the science standards, someone was asking about science standards in high school or whatnot. Um, I'm gonna try to avoid a lot of the political stuff, but there was a bill brought up in the Iowa either House or Senate that 
we have next generation uh, science standards, or I forget what exactly they're called, but it's something along those lines where it's it's basically pretty pro um, climate change, or you know, in favor of teaching climate change is something that should be taken seriously, in favor of teaching evolution. And I think that's where some of the resistance has been met. That there's a bill introduced that they don't want to bring these next gen climate standards into Iowa. Um, I think as of right now, they do have the standard, so it's a fight that they're trying to take away the standard and. My understanding of it is that that probably won't win. So it's my understanding that the next gen science standard does teach climate change and all that. So I don't know how good districts are actually doing on that or not. But it is different from state to state. I know that. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, yeah, it's a state to state kind of deal. So I think Iowa has been trying, I think actually it was about a year or two ago that they first introduced the next gen science standards. But um, so okay, I'll get started on my, uh, my deal here. Um, I'll just start off by actually telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm originally from West Des Moines in Iowa here. I've uh, been in Iowa my whole entire life. I did my undergrad at Iowa, studied journalism, graduated in 2012. And actually as an undergrad, I was really into sports and stuff. So I went into sports reporting and actually worked for the Johnson County Auditor's Office for a couple of years in between undergrad and then I went back to grad school two years ago. And kind of the thing there is that was my first real introduction into science reporting and environmental reporting and stuff. I'd say I always had a pretty casual interest in it and I'd usually read stories. I read a lot of media stuff anyway, so I had a fairly casual interest in it, but it was about 2014 was my first time really doing some of the journalism behind this. So maybe my point there is just that um, you know I was no science person. I would have maybe studied science instead of journalism if I was, but I think my point kind of just like a lot of scientists are really happy to talk to journalists and they want their stories out there and you know they'll communicate to you, talk to you like a normal person and not talk over your head or make you feel dumb or anything or hard to understand stuff. So um, I think there's a real place for science journalism and science communications out there. So that's kind of how I'll go into uh, a little bit about the center that Andrea had mentioned, Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research. I'm a um, graduate assistant there. I do communications work along with my colleague Casey. He was the other, um, one of the other guys there with us along with his wife. Um, so yeah, we focus on environmental research in Iowa, environmental research and news kind of affecting Iowa, the Midwest, and really the whole world. But we try to focus on Iowa since we are the University of Iowa. Um, the center consists of about a dozen graduate students, most of whom are from engineering and like scientific fields. Uh, however, Casey and I are the two from journalism uh, who do a lot of communications work. And I think some other centers and some other um, folks on campus actually kind of see that as a pretty cool thing that Seeger actually funds assistantships for two journalism students, masters journalism students. Um, the center also uh, consists of about 70 professors from the University of Iowa. I believe there are three from you and I that are part of our center. Um, a few from Iowa State, Des Moines University, Cornell, Indiana, Nebraska, and others. So they had, it's a real um, collaboration of all these different researchers from all over. Part of my responsibilities is we manage a blog, which we uh, update five days a week. We do a weekly radio segment that we send out to a bunch of the radio stations across Iowa. And we also kind of produce uh, tutorials and documentaries and kind of other video projects as needed. So we really kind of have our uh, feet in kind of all the different puddles there with, you know, print and radio and not television per se, but video. Um, so yeah, and then so I was one of the ones who attended COP21, COP21 along with Andrea, Casey, and his wife, Kelsey. Um, they funded our trip out there, so a bunch of our focus there was to kind of show, since we're a state-funded institute, a public university, our focus was to show how a lot of these issues matter to Iowans and how Iowa does have a role in kind of this big global climate discussion. So um, some of the events we attended, um, really fascinating event that we attended about soil health. Um, I don't know if you guys knew this, but ge the UN General Assembly actually declared 2015 the International Year of Soil. Um, and I was actually, to be honest, pretty disappointed that I only found one event on soil at the entire thing. Uh, with that said, there was a bit of a language barrier. Uh, a lot of the events were in French, and you know I don't speak French, so I couldn't go to those and report on them. But even then, there weren't more than maybe two or three events at the whole thing that were focused on soil, which was kind of disappointing on that. But um, you know, that's obviously real, very, very relevant here in Iowa, where we have ag is a huge industry here in the state, and um, you know, there are kind of other associated things, water quality issues that kind of come from that. So um, it might have been pretty helpful maybe for some leaders in Iowa to kind of see some of the things they were discussing there to reduce pollution and to kind of increase soil health and whatnot. Um, and then I guess you'd asked about, what was it, casualty insurance? I think, I don't remember, it was like disaster insurance. I don't know how much they went into like, um, anything like that specifically, but there was another event that 
again, we were trying to focus on why this is important to Iowans. Uh, Des Moines, Iowa is actually one of the insurance capitals of the world, so that's kind of our thing. Hey, Iowa's a big insurance place. We attended that event, but again, the language barrier was kind of getting in the way, like Andrea was saying, there were translators there, and they were just a little bit, um, not that their interpretations weren't, or their translations weren't good, it was that they're a little bit behind, so it was just so delayed, and as a reporter, it's really hard to report on this stuff and you know, have something to actually tell like the public about when, when I can barely understand the language or what's going on myself, so that was kind of unfortunate. And we also um, wanted to attend another event about vehicle efficiency, kind of making you know, Priuses and more uh, electro electric cars and more energy efficient vehicles that way, but, and I guess the Iowa tie there was Iowa's got one of the highest per capita rates of vehicles per person. I think we've got actually more than one vehicle for every person in the state, which kind of makes sense. It's only three million people in the state and you know, how many municipal vehicles or just other vehicles are gonna um, make that ratio where it is, but. Um, so yeah, unfortunately didn't attend that one we wanted to. I can't remember if they ended up canceling it or if it was that language barrier or not, but it was one of those two. As Andrea had mentioned, we were denied press credentials for the, the main event, which was kind of disappointing, but um, it's really cool going to the public event and uh, doing all those. Uh, as she also mentioned, we met with the mayors of Des Moines and Dubuque, which was pretty cool actually being, I guess I'm from West Des Moines, but being kind of from Des Moines was kind of cool meeting with Mayor County. Um, and I, I think it was County or was it Buell? I feel really bad, I can't remember. One of them had a really good point, I thought, how they were emphasizing that in regards to kind of government's role in a lot of this, that, that small municipal, like city governments can actually play a much bigger role in this because of their ability to kind of move things a lot, move things along much more quickly than kind of b the bureaucratic fe federal government and whatnot. You know, it takes a lot more, you're having to go through a lot more steps there. So I'm pretty sure it was County. His point was just, yeah, we're able to pretty much, if we can get the um, city council on board, and you know, if this is something we want to do, we can kind of do it and we can't tell anyone, we can't have anyone telling us that we can't do this. Um, and then so I guess kind of wrapping up here, I guess my big impression out of the thing was, um, you know, obviously pretty big deal that they met the, that they reached the agreement, but I guess as Andrea kind of did too, time will tell what will actually come of this. Um, I think it'll be, I don't know, I guess I'll be optimistic, but, uh, and then I guess one real quick short story here. Um, so one of the days I went there with a guy named John Frazier. He's on the board, Jim, of the Iowa UNA, I think, John Frazier. Uh, he was formerly in charge of the MBA program, I think, at the University of Iowa. And so he and I were going to go to this event at the uh, UNESCO building in, I don't know if it's downtown Paris, per se, but you can see the Eiffel Tower from there. So it's kind of in the um, midst of all that. So, so we're going to this. I go to the event, and I felt really guilty because like, it was really hard. The event wasn't really, you couldn't really cover it. There's nothing to write about or to tell the people about. It was just kind of listening. It was interesting being there, listening, and taking it all in. And so it got to be about noon, and I needed to go meet up with KC over at Le Bourget at the other event. So I was like, hey, John, I'm really sorry, man. I'm going to have to leave you. And he's like, totally cool. You know what? Here's 20 euro. Get yourself a cab, and I'll see you back at the hotel. I didn't know what the heck I was doing, but I didn't really want to tell him that, that I was kind of scared, didn't know what I was doing. So I go out on the streets of Paris, I actually waved down a cab, had no problem, the cabbie didn't really speak English, but I got my point across that I needed to go to the Luxembourg uh, metro stop, and I guess basically long story short, I got where I needed to go, and for me it was really a moment of, when it comes to sink or swim, I was able to swim in that situation, and for someone who doesn't speak French, has never spoken French, had never been out of the country before this, honestly, it was, uh, it was just reassuring knowing that I, was, I made it back, all right, so. <laughs> And then, um, and then real briefly, um, kind of as Andrea says, we bu as busy as we were, we were able to have some free time, you know, seeing the Eiffel Tower, the Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, I'm a huge classic rock fan. I actually got to see Jim Morrison's grave. He's famously buried in massive cemetery. Actually, Casey, his wife and I spent like three hours just walking around this giant cemetery. I never knew I'd have so much fun at a cemetery, but it was, it was pretty cool. And then lastly, I uh, actually Skyped with my parents the last day there. And probably the funniest thing out of that, my dad is really old school. Like he doesn't use a computer, he does not use a smartphone, any of that. And I remember when I got back home, I was talking to him, he's like, that was really cool talking to you on the computer, man. It was like Jetsons or something. <laughs> so that kind of shows you where he's from, Jetsons. But so, and then I guess kind of in, in my final conclusion here, I'll kind of go back to what I was saying at the beginning. For me, and not to even like say anything about the quality of our work or what we were doing, but you know, I think the environmental, the environmental research and the scientific res research is, you know, of course, very important, and that should be funded. We should be doing that, but you know, it's also really important for kind of communi communicating those stories to the public because, you know, if all this science is happening 
and no one's reporting on it. No one really knows. So it's kind of, you know, if a tree falls in the wood kind of thing. So um, my point there being maybe just there's, there's definitely a place for science journalism. I don't know if there are any journalists of the students here tonight, but um, I'd say consider that because I was really gung-ho on sports when I went into it. Sports are really competitive. You're probably going to live in a pretty small market or something like that. There's a huge demand for science communications jobs out there. So if that's kind of something you felt comfortable enough with, I would encourage you to do it once again. Um, oh, I forgot I was going to go with that. But and then one last thing here. Um, so working for Seeger, every year they do something called the Iowa Climate Statement, which each year they first released in 2011 and did the most recent one in 2015. And basically they get a bunch of professors and researchers from the um, universities, colleges, and community colleges all across Iowa to basically sign this document saying climate change is happening and it's affecting Iowa and we need to do something about it. So um, uh, the, the Iowa climate statement. Actually, I was going to do one shameless plug for my blog here at the end because you can get, not my blog, but the blog for the center I work for. Um, you can get it all there. IowaEnvironmentalFocus.org is the name of the blog. Um, you should be able to see on there we have a little tab for Iowa climate statement. We have a little tab for COP21 if you want to go and see the material, the, uh, the stuff that we did while we were over there. There was a bunch of video recaps. Andrea was actually like interviewed in one of them. Um, so yeah, I'd say check that out if you want. But yeah. Yep, five years. And they're, they know this is really important to us, and we go to meetings like this, and most of the people in the meetings are my generation and not yours. My kids wouldn't be at this meeting. Um, their big thing, and I'm assuming most of the young people in this room's big thing is, I need to get a job. <laughs> I need to be able to feed myself. I need to be able to afford a car payment so I can actually you know, get to a job. Their focus isn't the environment yet, hmm. and yet us older folks know a huge weight is going to be on them if we don't do something. So you, with your journalism and your blogging, do you really think that there's going to be a lot of people your age that are going to get really excited about your blog or what you write in a local paper, or do you kind of think like our three? And I don't. I I, I love my children. And they know we're passionate about this, but I can't make them be passionate about that. What do you think is going to make your generation passionate? You know, I guess I don't know. Maybe from my perspective, I actually feel like I kind of think the opposite of what you just said there. I think a lot of the young, fo young, young people I know are very, see climate change as a very big issue that, that needs to be addressed and whatnot. And I guess I'd put the caveat I might say there is that, I, I mean, I have to admit, I don't necessarily have the most diverse friend group, and most of my friends are college educated, so I don't know if that makes much of a difference, but. I do agree. I mean, it's like that's kind of a lot of what it is. It's like, how can you sell this, sell this to young people in a way that they will care about and think that it's something serious? And I think a lot do, but yeah, there's probably more work that needs to be done there when kids would rather be tindering. I think it has a lot to do with the environment too. I mean, in the cities, if you go to a large city, there's a lot of environmental problems, but there's just a more engaged community and everything. And here, you know, you grow up in these wide open spaces and the clouds are in the sky and it doesn't seem like anything is particularly wrong. It's hard to kind of make the connection that something is, you know. But if you go to a coast of India and see garbage and oil everywhere mm -hmm. and the environment really being uh, in terrible shape, you're much more aware of it. But here we, for the most part, really escape the uh, visual effect anyway. I, I totally agree. Maybe going off that a little bit too. I think it's just beyond unfortunate that science has become such a political, science has become a political debate around here. And it's just kind of like, you know, I understand you guys have your interests, but if we get to the point where you're not denying the science, no, the science is real, but I have this interest in the oil industry, so I'm going to, you know, it's like, okay, you're being more honest and I don't agree with you, but I just think that's, I don't, I mean, you know, the United States, I think some of the higher education is probably one of the best things we do in this country. You know, we have people from all over the world wanting to come to our universities to study here. And, you know, we've got good science, but, you know, there's politicians like denying the science, and that's, I don't know, teach their own, I guess. But. Well, it really should be more important to Iowa and our farming communities than maybe most of the world, because it's going to affect our farming and our crops and everything that we're important for. Absolutely, yeah. And the chemical runoff from farm fields, as you know, is terrible. 400 miles dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, largely from Iowa and Illinois, mm -hmm. and you know that's a, that's a huge thing. 
Yeah. Are, are weather aberrations, our, our recent droughts over the past several years, uh, weather, weather change or climate? Do you have a sense about that? Weather is the daily Oh, yeah. Change. Yeah. It's climate change. If that becomes a consistent pattern. Climate. But I'd be curious, I mean, I know I'm pointing you to do right there, but, you know, there's some talk around here about what your interests are and aren't, um, that it, it isn't something that is on your way, though, or maybe it is, and this might be an opportunity to say, no, it's not on my radar, which is fine. Um, how do we get it on your radar? Or, yes, it is on my radar, and this is the reason why, and can you help us do that? So, um, Personally, like I don't think I've learned a whole lot about mm -hmm. climate change and the environment just being in school. It's not something that was talked about a whole lot. Um, but I mean, just attending these informational meetings and knowing how serious it can be, um, maybe like that would help change people's perspectives on what they can do to help the environment. Could you share your major? Um, education and Spanish speaking. So do you have an answer on climate change? Um, well, not a whole lot, not in depth like this. Um, a couple of science classes, you guys are talking about the NDSS standards. Um, we have talked about those and discussed those, but um, not in depth like you guys have been talking or any about the events or anything. So there's a whole area of just education and awareness. Mm -hmm back to the consciousness raising of the 60s and 70s. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It's true. I guess I don't know what the most effective method is, you know, uh, in-person things like this or, you know, documentaries. I don't know what, what we need to do to engage people on this, but um, I don't know. I guess I'm willing to try about whatever it takes. <laughs>